So we've circulated the agenda and uh, we'll ask people to do uh, introductions. I'll call people out on the screen as I see them. And if you're with uh, an Indigenous community, uh, if you can describe your position in the community, uh, it'd be helpful as well if you can share uh, what you'd like to learn about Next Generation 911, if you have any specific questions or expectations of the meeting. And then we'll get into the overview of Next Generation 911. And then we'll talk about the status of Next Generation 911 implementation and timelines, followed by questions, answers, open discussion in the agenda. And we'll start with introductions. Uh, I am Zooming today from Sanamo Territory, uh, Casey with Finesse. I'm from the Heisla Nation. We're also known as the Kitimat Band. And I'll ask people to briefly introduce themselves as I call them on the screen, uh, starting with uh, Blair Strickland. Blair. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Blair Strickland. I'm Sorry, the you're programming. on mute, Blair. Oh, am I still on mute? No, I can hear you fine, Blair. Okay. Um, Blair Stuckland, I'm the program yeah, executive still can't for NG. Actually, we can, Casey. I'm going to try to click on. Yeah, Casey, it might be your mic that's or mic. Uh, uh, ask to unmute. I can hear him. I don't think Casey can hear any of us. Blair, do you want to log out and log back in? And we'll see if can you, you don't have do it, Blair. <laughs> no, I can't hear you. You're not, you're not the problem. Um, Casey. Maybe we I'll move on to uh, Stephen Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have the same problem, Casey. If you can't hear Blair, you probably can't hear me. But good morning, everybody. My name is Stephen Thatcher. I work with Blair at Ecom 911. Good morning to you all. It's my speakers. <laughs> all right, hold on. I'm sorry about that, folks. Yes, can you hear us now, Casey? Any advice would be helped. Uh, I'm not showing anything on my screen. I'm checking the chat. Brendan, are you able to hear? Yeah, I can hear. Uh, Brendan, I'm going to let you uh, take it away. My apologies, folks. I maybe maybe my computer stopped working. <laughs> I have to sign in and sign back out if you can hear me there, Casey. But uh, yeah, I guess we can get back to the uh, roundtable introduction there. So I think uh, Blair was up next there. If I recall. Sure. Uh, I'm Blair Stuckman. I'm the program executive for Ecom on NG911 program delivery. Awesome. Um, next, we can go to Clayton. Good morning, everybody. Clayton Harry with Alclay Resource Management and a strategic planner here. Thank you. All right, uh, next on my list is Daniel. Yeah, good morning. I'm Daniel Kempling with Malahat Nation. Nice to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Glad you could join. Uh, next on the list is Asunta, if I'm pronouncing it right. Sorry, good morning. Um, it's Asunta Morosi. I'm with TALUS. I'm the uh, NG911 relations, LGA relations uh, manager, and I look after working with the various regional districts in BC to um, sign off on the agreements that's required for your PSAPs to be able to transition to the new NG911 network. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, next to DeNova. Collins. Denova Collins. I'm the Emergency and Community Support Assistant with Tecumlips uh, Tuscomic uh, Emergency Planning Program. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction. Um, next on my list, uh, I'll move around a bit, uh, but Dee Edwards. That's me. It's Deborah Douglas. I'm new to Chiam. Uh, a Chiam band member, but I'm uh, new to this program. Emergency program coordinator is my title. Thank you. Awesome, glad you could join us. All right, um, next on my list is uh, Chili Frank. Good 
Hello, my name is Chile Frank. I work with Capstone. I'm here to just observe and listening. Thank you. So, thanks for joining. Um, let's see, next I have a connectivity boardroom. Good morning. My name is Jeannie Hollis. Um, our connectivity boardroom team is off, and I'm here with Assistant Deputy Minister Susan Sanford uh, from the Ministry of Citizen Services in the Connectivity Division. Awesome, so glad you could join. Um, Clayton Harry? I'm um, pretty sure it went already, but uh, Clayton oh, Harry at Del Clare Resource Management. Uh, good morning, everybody. My apologies for getting you to go twice. List uh, bounced around on me there. Uh, okay. <laughs> next, I have up uh, Clint Williams. Uh, good morning, uh, Clint Williams with the Knotsmont Tribal Council. Um, we represent seven bands on the Vancouver Island and three on the mainland. Uh, uh, yeah, looking forward to today's discussion and learning more about this next generation 911 and hoping hoping that it's available to all communities throughout the province. Awesome, glad you could join. Uh, next, I have Denise's iPad. Well, good morning, uh, Denise James with Penelope Tribe. I'm still learning this awesome program and looking forward to hearing more information. Thanks for joining me, Denise. Uh, next, I have Diane Keeler from Finesse. Good morning, everyone. Really looking forward to this session. I really don't know anything about uh, Next Generation 911, really. So, yeah, very excited to hear what, what's uh, available. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Dan. Uh, next, I have James Brown. Uh, James Fothigal Brown here, uh, Emergency Coordinator for Nenat Village, uh, DDDAT First Nations. Thanks. Great to see you, James. Uh, next, I have Janine Wallace. Hi, everyone. It's me, Janine, just here with the Connectivity Division and uh, at the Connectivity Boardroom. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, I have uh, Jeffrey Smith. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jeffrey Smith, TELUS Regulatory Affairs. Uh, I have overall accountability for anything 911 related with respect to public policy and government relations. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Jeffrey. And uh, next up is Jenny Lynn from Finesse. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Jenny. Um, I work with Finesse in the decision support team uh, with Brendan. It's Jenny. Um, <clears throat> next, I have Joyce in it. Hello, I'm Joyce Sinnett. I'm with GOBC, which is with Water, Lands and Resource Stewardship, so part of the province. Uh, my group works on a road centerline data set that covers the province called the Digital Road Atlas. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Yeah, we use that data set all the time. Uh, next up, I have Kathy Robinson. Good morning, everybody. I'm the Emergency Program Coordinator here in Hartley Bay, Big Gap First Nation. Thanks for joining, Kathy. Uh, Kristen Taylor from Stimaeus. You're seeing anything. Um, so we'll go next to Leah Carbon from FNTC. Thanks, Brendan. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leah Carpin, and I'm the Acting Manager of Engagement and Knowledge Exchange with the First Nations Technology Council. And uh, yes, looking forward to the session this morning. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for joining. Uh, next up is Michelle Jacobs from Finesse. Good morning, everyone. Michelle Jacobs. I'm with the Decision Support Team working for Brendan. Thank you. Michelle, uh, next I have NNE. Is 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Nena. I work with um, Capstone NG911. Nice to meet you, Nena, and apologies for mispronunciation. Uh, next up is Rob. Good morning, everyone. I also work with Capstone uh, Projects, uh, doing the NG911 work across Canada. And uh, here's an observer today. Thanks for uh, having us here. Yeah, thanks, Rob, for joining. Uh, next up is Roger Sterrett. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Roger Starrett, the uh, manager of the emergency response team uh, for GitGat First Nation out in Hartley Bay. Awesome. Thanks for joining. Uh, next yeah, hope, up, hopefully we can get some 911 service out here. And that you don't have it. Oops. No, no, we don't. I'll mute myself now so we don't talk out loud. Well, hopefully, these conversations can uh, make that a reality in the next little while. Uh, next up is Shannon Parsons. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharon Parsons. I'm from the Lone Oak Indian Band. I'm the education manager here, and I'm just here to gather information to share with uh, uh, management uh, when the time comes. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon, and apologies for uh, mispronunciation again. Um, next up is uh, Stephen Thatcher. Hey, good morning again. I started uh, this round off when uh, Casey went dark, but once again, it's Stephen Thatcher. Vice President of Operations at Ecom 911, and Blair and I are tightly tied on the NG911 project. Awesome. Thanks for the reintroduction. Uh, next up, we have Trey Hales from Finesse. Whoop. There we go. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Trey Hale. I'm a preparedness and response specialist for Vancouver Island for Finesse. I'm just here to, yeah, learn a little more about uh, Next Gen 911. I've been hearing about. So. Awesome. Thanks, Trey. Uh, next up, we have Vera Chen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Vera Chen with the Ministry of Citizen Services and assisting in the Next Generation Number One Funding Program. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Vera. Uh, next up is Wendy from Finesse. Hi, my, my name is Wendy Armiso. I am with the Preparedness and Recovery Team, uh, training officer for EOC and EFS. Awesome. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, next up is Yannick Lapierre from ISC. Hey, good morning. Yannick Lapierre from uh, Indigenous Canada. I'm the uh, emergency program coordinator, or sorry, not the emergency program, the uh, program advisor for Vancouver Island. Awesome. Thanks, Yannick. And last but not least, uh, Zana West. Hi, everybody. I'm Zaina West. Uh, I'm with the Moachat Machalat First Nations. I'm their health and safety and emergency preparedness coordinator. Just here to gather as much information as I can to help me with my role. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Zaina. Uh, all right. Uh, I think that takes us to, uh, oh, sorry, I see one more. Trudy Peterson from Vanessa. Trudy, Casey, I see your hand up. Did you get your mic sorted or speakers? <laughs> I got it all sorted. Uh, you can go ahead and introduce the next speaker. And uh, if if there's anyone we've missed, maybe just uh, jump in and introduce yourself now. I tried to go through the list thoroughly, even some people twice, but feel free to go ahead there, Cynthia. Apologies. Yeah. No, no worries at all. And, and the reason you're seeing the bottom of my computer is I just need to make my USB actually accept my computer. So we'll work on that too. Casey, you and I are having technical difficulties today together. Um, hello, everybody. I'm joining you from Halifax and the traditional lands of Mi'kmaq people. It's really great to be part of your event. And um, at Capstone, we deliver projects for 911 across Canada. So really looking forward to contributing where we can. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Cynthia. And then I guess uh, 
if we've got to everybody through introductions, then without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Blair Strickland for a bit of an overview of NG911. Great. And I'm just going to turn to a presentation here. Um, can everyone see my screen? Great. Okay. Um, so what I thought I would do today um, was share Ecom's story. Um, our, our story of writing this and getting ready for the NG911 transition. Talk a little bit about the, um, the approach that we've taken, the work that's involved. And my hope is that in, in walking through our story, um, I can shed some light on the NG911, what it is, and the types of considerations and things that um, are part of the, the work to get ready. And hopefully this information is portable to some of your organizations and the planning and thinking that you're doing around NG911 and 911 services generally. Um, you know, Chris Kellett is, is, is speaking after me and I'm gonna let him speak more in depth to um, NG911 and, and what it is. Um, I'll just touch on it lightly. So I'm gonna focus mostly just on, a, on our journey there. So firstly, um, but just in general terms, NG911 is a CRTC mandated transition of 911 technology. It will implicate all of the operations of all of the NG911 services as well. It's a technological shift that's rooted in a, a standard called MENA I3, you might hear that term. Um, but effectively, it's a shift in technology from old analog technology to common computer and network technology. Um, and so it's a, a technological shift. Uh, there's a brand new network that's being put in place to carry 911 calls. It's called the EZNet and TELUS who's here today is our service provider in Western Canada um, of that EZNet 911 network. And the real significance of all of this technological uplift is that it requires us to upgrade our existing 911 systems to be technically compatible with this new NINA I3 standard. So a little bit about the mandate. It's a um, couple key features. First of all, it's the mandate requires us to transition all of the voice calls to this new NG911 network. And it's also going to be introducing a new capability called RTT, so real-time text. Uh, real-time text is a little bit like the texting on your phone, but a little bit different. So the phone, the texting that we do on our phones today, you put in a text and you hit send and you kind of batch it. Well, real-time text is a new capability where it's keystroke by keystroke. So the call taker will have the ability to witness you typing in the message. And then what it does is it provides more contextual information about um, the caller when they're talking with a, a call taker. So um, on this journey, uh, we've already started. So TELUS has actually already turned on the EZNet or the new NG911 network. That happened in March, 2022. And the real significant date now um, on this mandate is on March of 2025, the old network, old 911 network will be turned off. So in order to ensure that we have functioning systems, we will need to have upgraded all of our core technologies to be compatible with the new NINA I3 standard. Um, I, I've highlighted a few dates here in, in that um, the RTT is going to be implemented um, progressively. And uh, as of last week, I think these dates are changing. So there's being work done with the CRTC working groups to actually shift these dates. And so Chris will probably give us the latest information about when the RTT capabilities will be introduced, but um, not to steal his thunder, but um, RTT is likely going to be implemented now on the March 2025 dates and into the later part of March 2025. So, um, you know, the, the shift to this new technology, I would liken to the shift to an information age. It's far more than 
uh, a technical shift. It, there's lots of um, considerations to readying our organizations for this new technology. Firstly, um, not unlike our, 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 your phone or your computer, we can expect a lot of a lot of change. So while we've been using 30 year old technology that's been very stable and has done what it's done in the same way for time and memoriam, um, this new technology will be far more dynamic. And so one of the things that we need to do as an organization is prepare ourselves for the need to update our systems constantly, be it a security patch like our phones get or our computers get, or it's a new version of software. There's new capabilities that will be added. And so change is going to be a big part of what we need to manage in this new environment. And that hasn't historically been the case with our existing technologies. The other difference is um, the amount of data that we're gonna be managing. So there's a physical aspect to this, there's a technological aspect to the managing of data, and there's a the governance um, aspect. So um, with this new capability, um, there will be far more data that will be in our organizations to be managed. Further, this technology is going to open the doors to all sorts of innovation and possibilities. So we can um, be thinking about into the future about integration of new types of devices, new capabilities, new functionality. We'll be thinking about adding um, artificial intelligence potentially into the future, analytical tools, drones, attaching our cars. The idea is that this foundation of technology once we get through this first implementation, we'll open the doors for a, to a far greater extensibility and interoperability with other types of devices and technologies. And with this newfound capability and information that, um, that we'll have, it, it ups the ante in terms of the privacy and the management of privacy. So we need to think about access models of this information, freedom of information, policies that govern who can see what. Um, it's a, gonna be you know, up, upping the amount of time and effort that we require within our organizations to manage the privacy, as well as the security. So as we move to um, this uh, new capability that's you know, common technology like our computers, we introduce the, the prospect of common criminals and cyber attacks. So um, in, improving our security capabilities and measures is a big um, dimension to uh, the changes that we're having to um, put in place. So Ecom's journey, it actually started um, quite a while ago. Um, in 2018, uh, we went out to the marketplace and I looked to see what vendors were were able to support the 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 NG Nina I3 uh, standards. Um, we we had, we identified a preferred um, set of um, software, and we went through an exercise of uh, of doing a proof of concept where we validated that uh, validated our thinking and and ensuring that those products were in fact able to. Um, meet our core functional requirements, our core workflows within our organization, and could connect to the ESINet as they suggested that they could. So we went through a fairly elongated, multi-phase proof of concept exercise. Emerging from that was a lot of information that then informed our business case process. And so our business case um, was about understanding you know, how many we required. So how many call takers we needed to support, how many licenses we needed to buy, how much capacity we needed, how many circuits we needed to upgrade, how many servers and things like that that we needed to buy. So we went through a fairly elongated business and complex business case process, as well as a, a, a program planning um, effort where we, you know, had to think about the team that we needed to put in place and the way that we were going to deliver um, the program. In June of 2022, we took these two major deliverables to our board and got uh, approval to proceed. And with that came a little bit of seed funding where we started to seed our program delivery team. 
So as of last summer, we started to um, hire fire some of the team that we required, not only for the delivery, but also for the support aspects of this. We started our vendor, uh, our vendor contracting conversations and our conversations with our contractor partners, which I'll speak to a little bit more. In March of this year, um, as, as, as many of you may know, there was funding provided by um, the provincial government to support our initiative. And with that, we were able to ramp up um, our team and our hiring to, to full capacity. We were able to con you know, continue to work on, on the development of our support team and work and actually sign up to the vendor agreements that we had been working through the previous year. So we've been able to start our contracting process in earnest and, and purchase the licenses and the hardware that we required. And since this time, we've been in full uh, execution mode um, and our team is now sort of flying at altitude and driving through the, the core project delivery work. So the approach that we've taken um, to our, uh, our delivery, to our program, a couple things here. First of all, we banded together with other organizations for a number of reasons. So we banded together with um, the RCMP, BCHS, and Saanich Fire. So these PSAPs are part of our program and they'll be um, residing and using our uh, NG911 um, call handling solution. So they are part of our, our program delivery. And this makes sense for a number of reasons. Um, it, it'll, it affords us the ability to better coordinate the rollout um, and delivery uh, uh, of the actual program itself. And then ongoing when there's future changes that we have, um, these other organizations working collaboratively with us. So coordination will be facilitated inherently by having them with us. There's obviously economies of scale. So much of the cost and the infrastructure lift um, in doing this work is, um, is um, sorry, my phone's just ringing there. Um, so economies, a lot of shared costs, a lot of fixed, you know, hardware that needs to be purchased, infrastructure that needs to be in place. So by banding together with other organizations, we can make, we can create some economies of scale. And further, we can afford to bring together a, a bigger and robust group of people to actually support and, and, and implement this so that we can bring better and more um, privacy, security, network kind of capabilities, technical expertise to the table to, to support us. Another big dimension to um, our approach and delivery is that we've partnered with vendors um, where they are leaning on their expertise in these technologies. So we're not going it alone. And further to the point that I just raised, um, you know, there's, there's, there's safety in numbers. There's a bit of girth that we've got in our program by having multiple organizations come together, which allows us and affords us the ability to hire um, more people, so more capacity and more capability. So where it's not necessarily economical to have, um, you know, hire a person with ex each expertise, we can have privacy experts, we can have security experts, we can have networking experts at a level um, that su can support multiple organizations that we may not otherwise been able to afford if we were going it alone. And then, of course, um, we've obviously had to have a very deliberate um, project delivery plan um, where we have you know, looked to orchestrate the delivery of our program across organizations and taking advantage of the fact that we've got multiple organizations participating us, with us in this. And so our, our respective projects are all being synced up so that the delivery of NG across our, the, the province will be in a coordinated fashion. So just a little bit about the budget. Um, so the two major parts to the budget, two, two areas to think about. One of them is the one-time costs. And so this is some, some of the odd, uh, obvious items um, like hardware, like software, circuits, networking equipment, and things like that. Um, it's also your implementation team. So um, we went through an exercise of identifying all of those um, constituent parts. There's also the element, of ongoing steady state costs, so your operational costs. And, and in this bucket, there's the support team that needs to be in place to sustain and maintain this. There's licenses um, 
that often have uh, an ongoing cost associated with them. And then the other item is, is the operational impacts that NG brings. So the introduction of RTT will have an impact on our organization. It'll affect call handling times. Uh, we potentially will see an increase in calls. And so these are the types of effects that we've tried to anticipate in and the impact that they'll have on our staffing within the service, uh, the 911 service call taking operation of ECOM. So the way that we've gone about our, our, our program, um, we've divided the program into seven discrete projects. Um, the bookend projects are the top and the bottom, the obvious one being the system build. So obviously we're introducing um, a colossal amount of technology. And then the, then the other project is the service uh, readiness. And so this is all of the support services that we're having to put in place. I consider these kind of the bookend projects of bringing forward both the technical and the support capabilities to the organization. And then in the middle, we have five discrete implementation efforts. And so, um, you know, the logic behind this project organization is that it, uh, it aligns to our work packages. It's also how we're aligning our project teams and our staffing to the effort uh, and keeping us organized. Now, a little bit about the work. I'm not going to drive into all of the, the nitty gritty details uh, of all of the work, um, but with regards to the system build, we have two data centers worth of, of equipment going in. So that's our servers and storage, um, networking and firewalls and circuits that are going in, all the cybersecurity capabilities that are being put in place. We have 17 different locations across the, the um, across the province that are being connected in. I think well, I will highlight for the group that there's three different copies of our software. So um, if you recall, I talked a lot about change and the fact that this is gonna be a very dynamic um, solution. And we can expect to have security patches and software updates on an ongoing basis. And that means that we need to be able to make those changes safely um, and without jeopardizing our production environment. So we actually have three different copies of the, uh, of the solution. We have a production that we keep pristine. We'll have a development environment and we'll have a test environment. Um, so that creates the additional overhead in, in terms of having to manage it, but it's necessary given that we think that this is gonna be a very dynamic um, and, 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 and a dynamic environment that we're, well, part of that, that dynamic aspect I should highlight is, you know, this is very new technology too. And so um, where we were dealing with 30 year old uh, solutions and technology that were very stable, um, you know, we can, we can expect that there is some risk of, uh, of things untowards things happening in, in our solution and that we'll constantly need, be needing to manage that um, through our technology. So this whole work stream is going to follow a pretty traditional uh, system project where there's an architectural activity. We go through, a, we've been going through design processes. We'll be installing it into all of these different locations. There's gonna be configuration efforts. And of course, the very robust texting, testing exercise that we will be doing in terms of the core technologies, but also in terms of all the call flows and things like that, that we need to make sure um, are in place properly. So a substantive amount of work uh, on the system build side. I consider this a bit of the stealth scope in an initiative like this, where um, we don't often think that this is gonna be a big lift, but given that we're talking about a whole new um, type of technology, we're having to do an extraordinary amount of uh, work with our service operations team to ready. We're adding people, um, to, to the team, we're having to retrain existing team members to the new technologies. Um, we're adding skill sets um, to, to the group. Um, and we're having to even think about the organization of the technology services um, department within ecom and having to, to rework some of that to factor in this big shift in, in, in technology. There's also a lot of 
um, process work that needs to be done. So there's new support processes that need to be put in place. There's old processes that need to be reworked. When I'm thinking about processes, I'm thinking about the way that we communicate and work with our vendors. So when things happen, we will you know, be looking to resolve issues, but then we'll be backing into our vendors and needing to think about how those relationships work. And then further, um, we have uh, our partner organizations, BCEHS, our CMP, Saanich Fire, and a lot of those processes will extend into those organizations as well. And then, you know, in, in keeping with the people, process, and technology uh, changes afoot here in this service dimension, um, the technologies are changing as well. So the way that people are diagnosing issues, the way that they're monitoring their systems, the way that they're remedying the systems and upgrading them, those are all going to be changed as well. There's a whole new toolkit that's being put in place. And so not only do we need to design all of these new service aspects, there's a substantive amount of work to implement them as well so people are familiar with them and then can follow along. We can't turn on the system until all of our services are in place and operation. And for those visual thinkers, um, which I am, this is just another view of that services model. So in the middle, you have all of that core technology that you stood up in your build exercise. So we've got our software, we've got our different environments, we've got our infrastructure. Wrapped around it is all of the capabilities that are part of that. So that's the voice capabilities, that new RTT, the integration to our, um, you know, our, our CAD systems, call logging, our failover, Capability. So that's the capabilities of that system. But then on the left are all of those things that we do to sustain and maintain the solution. And so this is system change control. So the way that we manage changes through our environments, the testing that we do, the training and retraining of our staff. It's the service desk that we, that we have in place to answer calls when things and incidents happen. Um, it's about planning for the future when think people are thinking about new functionalities and capabilities and how we work through that and introduce that into the solution. And then the transition. So the third sort of major dimension to our, our, our program is the transitions that we're going to go through. And this is the, the technical transition from the old technology to the two, to the new technology to the um, the, the graceful you know, transition of staff from their current world, the current technologies that they're using to the, the before, the, during the transition, and then the after so that our users are comfortable throughout the whole process. Each organization, where well, there's five of them that are gonna be going through this implementation has been divided into smaller implementations. And so there's gonna be a whole sequencing and staging of this, which I'll share in a, in a couple slides. So the work that we're doing effectively this summer, it's about uh, a couple of key aspects of design. So we've got our core technology design laid out, but there's some end user facing type of design work that we are hot and heavy on right now, working with our user groups to, to sort out things like reports, things like the, the user interface, um, RTT, there's lots that's not fully known about RTT and how it's gonna work and what policies and processes are gonna be followed for RTT. So that's the work that we're doing through this summer. In the fall, we'll, we'll be we're doing lots of planning around the transition itself. So what, did the, what does that transition cycle really look like in terms of the day-to-day -day activities, that within the day kind of activities, both technically and with our users? UAT will be a big part of what we do. So user acceptance testing, making sure that the way that we've stood up the system is in, is in fact how the users were expecting it to be stood up and that they, they're gonna help us validate that we got that right. And then there's the transition prep. So it's putting in those final pieces of, of activity. It'll be like the training of staff. It'll be those final technical changes on the floor within our operations that get put in place right before we go live. And then of course, there's the big transition effort itself where we're working face-to-face -face with the users and supporting them through the transition from the old technology to the new and supporting them afterwards, soaking and monitoring, making sure that the system and the solution is holding water and that there's no leaks and that it's uh, everything's working as it's expected. 
And so overall, um, this sort of paints the picture of, of what it looks like. So between now um, and the end of this calendar year, we need to get the system stood up. So that's our job one is to stand up to core technology. In 2024, it'll be about shifting uh, e-com and our partner organizations um, to, the new, to the new solution. Um, it's uh, we're overlapping. We don't have the luxury of time. I think one of the key messages here is that there is no slack in our schedule and that we're driving to um, migrate all of our, our contracted partners and e-com within 2024, recognizing that there is no big bang implementation with each organization that will be done incrementally um, within, each, within each org. Um, depending on, in some cases it might be site by site, some other organizations might be doing it by um, subgroups within the, within, the, within the operation. The idea is that we have fully transitioned as best that we can every organization by the end of 2024 so that we have 2025 as contingency. Um, there's lots of technical risk associated with uh, standing up this program and we need to be planning for um, the potential that something has uh, affects us and slows us down in some fashion, and so we're we're working hard to build out our plans such that 2025 is a is a contingency in our schedule. And then, um, just some parting thoughts is that this is NG911 is really um, uh, this first mandate is really just the the foundation. So it's about voice and RTT. But the, the core capabilities that we're putting in place technically, as well as operationally in terms of that support team, the idea is that we'll be able to build off it and continue to evolve the solution to meeting the needs of um, public safety and, and, and our responders. So it's the beginning of the journey. Those are the, the, the slides that I prepared for the group uh, in terms of Ecom's journey. Um, I don't know, Casey, is this, do you want to take questions now or is, is Chris on the line? And Yeah, does anyone see Chris uh, K on the participants list yet? I know he's uh, he's trying to jump from another meeting. I think if Chris were on by now, you'd have heard. Ah, uh, so I we have- I the names and I don't see him there, Casey. We have Chris uh, scheduled for 11 and he's, um, he was unable to start at 10 or 10.30. And I think it would have um, set the stage a bit more on um, kind of how this uh, relates to Indigenous communities. Like, what does this mean for Indigenous communities? Um, so while we're waiting for Chris, um, I wonder, uh, Stephen or Blair, uh, my sense of Next Generation 911, like we've talked about, it's a huge multi-year international change movement that Canada's embarked on and BC is doing. It's uh, it's multi-year, it's it's incredibly complex, changing from the, uh, the old system from the 1950s. And I know the province has assessed uh, the state of 911 in BC, and it's fair to say that um, 911 services are not available all throughout BC, including the different systems. And I wonder if um, either of you could speak to that in a little bit. And then Chris is really going to talk about, you know, the difference between that old system and the new system and the requirements. But uh, while we're waiting, um, could could either of you give that two minute overview of just the history and the and the relevance and how uh, the magnitude of this changes? History. Hmm. Um, in terms of the history of NG911, I'm not sure that I'm the, I'm the guy to, to, to speak to the history as it relates to the province. Um, I will say that if you don't have um, 911 services today, you know, NG911 does not bring uh, 911 services to where they don't exist currently. So, right, uh, so the, if the infrastructure and, and, the, and the organization isn't in place, that the NG is not inherently going to be bringing that forward um, in terms of a, a capability. 
So let me elaborate on that a little bit. So Blair's quite right. Uh, the major, I mean, I think the expectation for some people is that next generation 911 will provide a service that doesn't currently exist. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, communities that don't have 911 service now will not be able to transition directly to engine 911 for the foreseeable future. Um, there are considerable parts of the province that don't have telephony infrastructure right now. I know there are plans afoot and perhaps citizen services can comment on that in terms of uh, what the plans are to move connectivity and communications infrastructure into different parts of the province. I think the other people to answer questions in terms of connectivity and what it takes would be our TELUS representatives who introduced themselves earlier. So Casey, maybe I'll turn it back to you to decide whether you want to go to one of those two groups first. Sure, and uh, my apologies, everyone. We're, we're waiting for um, for Chris to come in and, and chat about those topics. But my understanding is um, if there's a 911 services in place and the transition to next generation 911 uh, requires an administrative agreement uh, with TELUS and, the, uh, and others, and if a First Nation has an agreement through, say, a municipal type services agreement for 911, then they they uh, should at some point renegotiate and update that for implementation of next generation 911. And then for implementation of it, uh, there's enhanced 911 mapping and there's emerging mapping standards for that. And then there's a minimum internet connectivity that's required for First Nations. And then, of course, like this won't generate 911 all throughout BC, but I'm hoping that the transition to next generation 911 will lead to Indigenous engagement and kind of a roadmap for how to improve 911 services all throughout BC. That's that's kind of my hope as an Indigenous person. Is that a, a fair, quick overview, Stephen or Blair, or any of the other reps on the on the line from TELUS? I'll certainly say from Ecom's perspective that it is. Um, you may recall, Casey, that uh, our CEO and president made comments to the all party committee in front of the legislature the year before last with respect to reform of the Police Act. That included uh, additional access to 911 services for members of the public, as some of, of those ideas are, I think, being discussed in government. But as I said, I think the representatives from, from the provincial government on the line here who might be able to, to speak better, but certainly in terms of Ecom's. Uh, view, uh, that's an accurate summary. Uh, tell us, or provincial reps, would anyone like to kind of jump in and talk about connectivity or or the other topics? Hey, it's uh, it's Jeff here from TELUS. I guess I can add a little bit to this. Um, so the E911 model, and that was the legacy network that Blair was talking about, required I mean, basically three things to get 911. Uh, so the first was uh, connectivity. You needed some sort of wireline or wireless connectivity. Two was civic addressing. Um, and then three was an agreement with TELUS to provide 911 services. And, and to be clear, TELUS doesn't charge for access to E911 or in the new world that we're going into, NG911, there's no charge to municipalities, regional districts, First Nations. Like they're tell us doesn't charge for it. It's it's for it's a public good service and provided free of free of charge. And so once you have those three things, then you can get on to the you know to the E911 network and then of course the NG911 network. The big difference between E911 and NG911 with regards to the three requirements. E911 required an agreement with TELUS directly. Um, NG911 only requires uh, uh, agreements with regional districts within the province of British Columbia. So First Nations, um, Indigenous uh, groups don't, don't actually need to sign an agreement. You don't need to update your E911 agreement. You just go directly through your regional district uh, to sign an agreement with TELUS. As, as far as the connectivity piece goes, um, you know, TELUS is constantly looking uh, at its at its network architecture um, and expanding its service area. And as Blair stated, and as sort of Stephen Echo, NG911 doesn't bring connectivity, it brings 911 services to areas where E911 already exists. Thank you. Does anyone have any brief questions uh, on, on this so far? And we'll learn a lot more uh, at 11 when Chris comes on as well. 
And Casey, I'm here now. Oh, Chris. Yeah. So any any really quick questions, and then we can uh, we can go on to the next presentation, which, uh, in my view, my apologies, I think it would have really set the stage for uh, for the discussion. Ivan, I see your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and sorry, my my camera is not working today. I'm a little bit uh, off offline, uh, just getting uh, enough uh, bandwidth connectivity. <laughs> For, for sound so but I just wanted to make a quick comment on the um, on the aspect of connectivity and uh, I just came a little bit late but I am sure that it was at least mentioned that uh, our ministry has been working on the connectivity portion of access for uh, remote communities indigenous communities and so on for the last uh, I'm just gonna say five to ten years and we are still in the work um, the works for for getting better connectivity which is the first component that uh, the colleague from TELUS was talking about so that portion of connectivity is something that not necessarily related directly to 911 but as part of that ecosystem of different components uh, we're working on and and we're aware of that because in many of the communities that we go the very first question that we're asked is about uh, connectivity for the purposes of emergency management and public safety. So, so yeah, I mean, this is, there is not the intent of this call, but we can uh, we can for sure um, continue the, the engagement with the different uh, parties that are uh, interested in understanding what the connectivity uh, portion of of this whole system will will look like in in you know, three five years from now. Thank you for that. And maybe, uh, Chris, before um, we have you launch, I'll quickly go over just a few questions that are in the chat, uh, just in the order they appeared. Uh, there was a question asked about what about elders and others that don't really text and how will NG911 impact them? You know, when we talked about the text capability, um, there was a question about, I'm just scrolling down. Will there be limits or requirements for fiber optic cable or cell service levels such as 3G or 5G that some communities may not have? Um, when there is mention of operating systems, software, hardware, a question on what are the operating systems that run these digital systems, Microsoft or self-designed? And keeping on scrolling. Are there plans to expand 911 services to remote communities that do not currently have a 911 service? Um, I can cover that, I, that, Casey, during my presentation. Sure. And then uh, the last one, as a first responder, our service is not very good using our radios and cell connection doesn't cover our island except for certain spots. How will this impact us? It won't. Yeah. Um, and then my my hope is that there'll be an engagement and there'll be some type of roadmap for improving 911 throughout BC. Uh, work to be done in years ahead. Um, and then a comment, one of the benefits of phone lines is the functionality when there are localized power outs. Correct me if I'm wrong, moving to a digital system means the systems won't work during power outages. Or are there contingencies to ensure this system will work? during localized power outages as the previous system did. This would be for folks who still use landlines where there's no cell service. So uh, with that being said, Chris, I can turn it to you. And if you have a presentation, uh, you should be able to share the screen. Thanks, Casey. Uh, you should be able to see my presentation now. Uh, perfect. OK. Um, let me just uh, go, this is a short presentation, but there's uh, quite a bit to talk about. So I'll, I'll do that. So I'll start off by introducing what the CRTC Emergency Service Working Group is. Uh, it's an advisory body that was established by the CRTC way back in 1997 uh, to do work uh, either directed by the CRTC or approved by the CRTC. Um, today, this group has over 500 uh, stakeholders from across uh, the country uh, that include public safety answering points, uh, emergency service uh, responders or dispatch agencies, 
Uh, the major telephone uh, companies that provide 911, uh, of course, Telus in our territory, uh, Sastel and Bell in uh, the rest of Canada, as well as uh, all the uh, wireless service providers that are out there and many uh, uh, other uh, telephone service providers that provide uh, either landline or uh, or wireless services across Canada uh, or in uh, regions of Canada. So our group is large and we work on a lot of different tasks. Uh, there, if you type CRTC ESWG into a web browser, you'll see, you'll get uh, you'll get taken to our website where we have everything listed in terms of our activities. Um, it would take uh, a lot longer than this meeting for me to cover everything that we do. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, my role uh, is I participated with this uh, with the emergency service working group since 1998. I've been the chair for the past 15 years, uh, since 20, 2009 till present. Uh, and today's uh, uh, presentation is going to cover what is NG911. What's the difference between enhanced 911 to NG911 transition versus basic 911 and unserved areas uh, transition to NG911? Because it's different. And then uh, this is a fairly short uh, uh, meeting today. So there will, uh, from my perspective, if you want to have an opportunity to connect uh, and do this uh, in the future again, I'll be happy to assist uh, with different stakeholders that you have out there and provide further information a bit more uh, detailed in relation to connectivity requirements, uh, mapping and administrative agreements. So that's the topics I want to cover for today. Um, and let's talk about why we're doing this. So today we have a legacy 911 system. Um, it's based on circuit switch. It's, uh, it can only handle voice and text. It's very specific to uh, your location on the network. It provides uh, in some areas, uh, the majority areas in Canada, you get uh, name, callback number, location, uh, service provider and class of service, meaning whether it's residential home, uh, or, excuse me, residential business, uh, uh, wireless, et cetera. And then it is, uh, the E911 system is heavily reliant on addressing, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, is one of the barriers that exist today in terms of people going uh, on to 911. What we're moving to, or we've already moved to, uh, we put it into place recently, uh, is an IP-based uh, multimedia, uh, RTT stands for real-time text uh, capability, uh, multiple sources of location information uh, and enhanced information about the call, the caller and the location. And as I'll cover here in a minute, one of the key things we'll be moving away from is uh, our dependency on uh, addressing and moving to mapping and, our, and using uh, call routing based on the location that's uh, making the call. So a handset uh, or could even be a computer in the future. Well, that's the, the, and the reason we're changing this is the legacy system's 30 plus years old uh, and uh, is essentially uh, worn out and it's being replaced. And I'll cover uh, the transition process on my next slide. So what is the difference between enhanced 911 and NG911 in the transition? So today, uh, the CRTCs are already mandated Telesastel and Bell to replace their existing E911 networks with NG9, NG911 networks by the 4th of March, 2024, or 25, I should say. So um, not far down the road, uh, really less than two years from now. Uh, TELUS, SASTEL, and Bell already launched your networks back on the 1st of March, 2022, 
and we're in the middle, uh, we're coming up towards the middle of a three year transition period uh, where both E911 and NG911 are running at the same time to assist our BC public safety answering points uh, to move to NG911. Now, uh, I know Ecom uh, and Blair uh, has already done his presentation and given you a good idea what their transition looks like. It's, it's a major transition. There's a lot of work. Uh, and of course, they're looking after not only Ecom, but the RCMP and uh, uh, BC Ambulance as well. So the transition plan for moving from areas that have today uh, enhanced 911, which is the majority of this province, uh, I'll talk about some exceptions in a minute here, uh, it is the transition between E911 to NG911. That's well defined and well laid out. We also have a separate task, uh, which is basic 911 areas. So today, up in uh, Prince Rupert who are an area, they are supported by City West uh, Telephone Company. And uh, the Northern Rockies Regional Municipality are supported by Northwest Tel. Uh, the rest of the province is covered by TELUS. Both those areas have basic 911. The difference between basic and enhanced is basic, you get a phone call um, and you do not get any information uh, other than call display information, not uh, 911 information on uh, the phone number or location. So no phone number, no location, or no uh, confirmed telephone number, uh, and no uh, location information in the basic 911 area. Then, uh, so one of the reasons we have a separate roadmap is we, we have basic 911 areas in the northern part of this province. We have them in the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, and Newfoundland, Labrador are the uh, three other major areas with basic 911 in Canada. Uh, we have a separate process. We've been running that process here now just over a year. We're, uh, we're currently working on a roadmap but that roadmap has significant dependencies on defining uh, the, the standards for addressing and mapping uh, moving forward for next generation 911, as well as the future of uh, geodetic call routing, which is what I talked about earlier, the move away from relying on addressing and relying on a map in the future to process calls. Uh, and that has significant uh, benefits. The key benefit it has is it eliminates the civic addressing barrier that exists in many unserved areas today. The major hurdle that, uh, there's two major hurdles. One was they don't have addressing and two, many don't have uh, all three emergency services. Uh, so police, they have ambulance, they have, but many don't have fire. Uh, or have agreements in terms of fire. And so that's been a limiting factor uh, in some uh, unserved areas. Overall, uh, in relation to uh, the civic addressing barrier, it does not get eliminated until 2027 or and beyond. Uh, there's a bunch of work we have to do to change the whole foundation of 911 so it will support uh, uh, map-based call routing. So that work is ongoing, but for that reason, we have a completely separate roadmap that we're developing. It's not built yet, um, but it is being built as we speak uh, to uh, say, how do I get a basic 911 area or an unserved area uh, onto next generation 911? So what are the current considerations? Uh, is my First Nations part of an existing E911 or B911 network? So the answer for some First Nations uh, will be yes. Uh, they are part of an existing um, arrangement as far as E911. Uh, and uh, for them, the transition plan I just talked about for E911 to NG911 applies and they can uh, we'll be working on making sure 
the PSAP that serves their area uh, is transitioning to next generation 911. Um, and the, the public safety answering points uh, that uh, are different. So the first primary point of contact everywhere uh, in BC is ECOM, except for the city of Nelson and uh, one exception over on the island uh, uh, for national defense uh, on one of the bases there. Otherwise, all calls for 911 uh, currently come in through ECOM uh, as described by Blair, I'm sure earlier. Um, the other uh, uh, public safety answering points are the secondaries. They're called secondaries because information is transferred from ECOM to them to facilitate local response. Um, uh, and that could be local or regional response. In the case of BC Ambulance, of course, they have things broken up to the Vancouver area. The Kamloops uh, really serves uh, most of the interior of the province. And then they have a separate uh, dispatch for the island. Um, for police, they have eight uh, operational communication centers, uh, plus all of the municipal, uh, applicable municipal uh, police dispatch centers. And then finally, uh, for fire, there's, some, uh, there's a, uh, a handful of regional dis uh, fire dispatch centers that look after large areas of the province. Uh, uh, and a couple smaller ones that exist uh, to, today where we are transitioning them over to the next generation 901. So the other question is, is my First Nations an unserved 901 area? Uh, and the answer in many cases, unfortunately, still is yes. So as I pointed out, this isn't something, uh, the, the barrier today is uh, the requirement for civic addressing and um, we really recognize we need to eliminate that barrier and move it so that if you're an unserved First Nations area, in the future, we can put a, a mapping, uh, a map around a coordinate or a polygon as it's called around your particular community. And within that community, we can slice that uh, map up into pieces that make sense in terms of where the administration building may be, where businesses may be, where residential may be, and cut it up into smaller pieces that we could uh, put what we call pseudo or fake addresses uh, to satisfy uh, the ability to differentiate between the different pieces within your uh, First Nations uh, area. That is work uh, that, uh, you know, moving forward, we're happy to assist with what that means for you as an unserved area. Uh, and uh, can assist uh, with uh, um, moving forward. Um, the other question that arises, do I have, a, or it should be asked is, do I have an existing mapping capability locally, or do I get this service through somebody else like the ICI Society, the re, your local regional district, and or GOBC? GOBC may have uh, the road network map for your particular area uh, by way of example. ICI Society may have uh, some uh, addressing or mapping uh, done for your community. Regional districts often have addressing and mapping uh, for different reasons associated to uh, uh, First Nations that are part of their regional districts. So overall, uh, there is work that can be done moving forward together uh, to assist as I said, it's, it's detailed work that requires uh, probably different stakeholders from, uh, from unserved areas to uh, work with us, uh, to look at uh, how to get ready for the future. And as I said, the future is 2027 and beyond uh, until we'll be ready to uh, look at NG901 uh, in B901 and NG901 or unserved areas and putting next generation 901 into those areas. So that's a quick, quick overview of where things exist today. 
and I'll turn it back over to Casey and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that, I, that I can answer or Blair or anybody else uh, that's a presenter today. Thank you, Chris. Uh, there was one in the chat during the presentation. Will tracking work if the caller is using a VPN either knowingly or not? So um, VPN, uh, let's say I have a cell phone and I've got the VPN flipped on in terms of my cell service, just for obvious reasons. Um, that has no bearing on 911. Um, the, that data and how your whether your data is connected or to a VPN or to a local uh, uh, cell uh, service or even a local service has no impact on 911. When you dial 911, uh, the call is uh, put onto the telephone network and is handled separately. And whether you're on a VPN or not does not matter. Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, by raising hand or perhaps jumping in, are there any questions, uh, especially about this last slide, if you're uh, an unserved uh, in an unserved area? If anyone has any uh, any questions. And James put in the chat a follow-up on the uh, question. I asked because you said the user could call through a computer. And since no computers I know have SIM cards, I assume the system would make network calls, question mark. So what I meant, uh, thanks for that, uh, James. Uh, and sorry to confuse the issue. So uh, if you, uh, in the future, uh, we are looking at the ability to process calls and get location information from uh, computer-based uh, telephone dollars. Um, that is not available right now. Uh, and if you were using a VPN service from a computer and it showed your location as something completely different, because uh, that's what VPNs do, uh, then that could have implications there's a strong possibility that if we set something up like that, we would uh, look at um, something occurring within the processing of that call that would put you back onto your local network and take you off your VPN. We have something similar today that happens on wireless. Uh, use an example, if you have your uh, location services turned off on your phone, when you dial 911, your location services are automatically turned back on. Uh, so there is things we can do at a network level to uh, deal with call processing. But at this point, it, it would be something we'd have to consider in terms of the implications of VPN uh, from a computer in the future. Thank you. and. Uh... I see, uh, Stephen, you're offering to comment on the question about elders and others who don't use text. Yeah, so I think the short answer to that uh, question, Casey, is that uh, adding real-time text uh, into the infrastructure, and maybe Chris can describe a little bit how that's anticipated to work, is really an added bonus. It doesn't take anything away from a caller calling 911. It's simply advantageous to people who feel that they can't, they are unable to speak or unable to hear or feel that they don't want to be heard while making a call for emergency assistance. So, uh, Chris, it might be helpful at this juncture to explain a little bit how you anticipate real-time text to work, because it is different, uh, as Blair outlined, from sort of the text messaging, this SMS that we're all accustomed to from our phones. Sure. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, so how uh, real-time text will work, and we're looking at launching that on the 4th of March 2025, just from a, uh, a date perspective, that's when we're looking at having the service available. Um, the, the call will still come in as a voice call, and within that voice call, you'll have the ability to uh, write on your phone dialer to press a little icon or, or, uh, and bring up a text uh, box where you can text message. 
It's not a separate SMS application. It's actually built right into the 911 application and there's nothing you have to do. You can use it or not use it. It's completely your choice. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, still keeping an eye open for hands raised. And if uh, there's none, I'd like to ask a question for the rural and remote Indigenous communities that are probably um, in a uh, area that's either unserved or basic. Um, when you talked about the separate roadmap being built, um, I'm just wondering if you can talk a bit more about that. Uh, who's involved in that roadmap and how communities uh, can learn a bit more. And I'll preface that with um, that I'm assuming that there's a fair bit of information out there about where these unserved areas are, as well as um, as well as the uh, level of internet connectivity and the challenges on that part. So, yeah, Casey, let me tackle this in two pieces. First, I'll answer your question, the who's involved. Um, the stake, uh, there's uh, basic 911 stakeholders that I mentioned earlier from Northern BC, from uh, the Yukon, Northwest Territories, Newfoundland, Labrador, that are uh, actively involved in terms of that work. All the telephone service providers involved, uh, especially City West and Northwest Tel uh, for this province, uh, and of course, TELUS. Um, and the, the, from a community perspective, uh, there's different community stakeholders from, uh, uh, from unserved areas and B911 areas that are represented in terms of this uh, working group that we have pulled together for it. Uh, memberships open if somebody wants to join us uh, or wants to get on the distribution list to see what the output is. Uh, they're certainly welcome to do that. You can do that just by sending an email to me and I can send it to the, tif uh, to the owners of that particular activity. Uh, the second part of your question is uh, unserved areas. Are we aware of those? There's two issues that exist today in unserved areas. One is what I'll call access network issues. So some uh, will be serviced by landlines, but those landlines, there's no civic addressing. So there's no way uh, to uh, get on to the E911 network uh, because that is a, a barrier at this point. Those landlines in the future, uh, for the folks that still have them, uh, will work uh, perfectly well with uh, with NG911 moving forward, whether you're making that call from a landline. Um, if, if the other piece is if you have cellular, which is often a problem uh, in those areas in uh, more remote areas is uh, cell coverage. Uh, there's nothing that NG911 is gonna do with the help with cell coverage. We do the CRTC, not related to the 911 uh, group, but related to the broadband or the availability of internet, is actively working on addressing the difficulties that exist with proper access uh, to all communities in this uh, country that have uh, that are outside the large populous areas that don't have very good uh, internet or don't have it at all. So broadband does present an opportunity as we move forward, as, as things get better in terms of broadband, it introduces a new opportunity in terms of connectivity for NG911 in the future. And that's why I talked about it earlier. Uh, so it could help communities uh, in terms of that. The other thing uh, that uh, is out available right now uh, is satellite phones. And satellite phones do work with 911 today. They'll work with NG911 tomorrow. The difficulty we have with those devices is they don't provide any location information. So they are sent to a uh, operator, uh, what we call a third party operator to a different place in Canada. It's usually a place called Northern 911. They answer the phone. If they, they then transfer the call to TELUS Operator Services, who then transfer the call to Ecom, who then transfer the call to uh, the local uh, uh, fire, police, or uh, ambulance dispatch center. 
So that's a pretty long, circuitous route, and we're trying very hard to cut out the the two operator services and be able to get those calls directly to ecom in the future. So that is one thing that we know is a uh, a gap in terms of the existing arrangement that needs to be closed. We're working on that at the same time that we're working on the uh, mapping and and getting that into place for 2027 and beyond. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Jean, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. We can hear you. Sorry, a little bit of an echo here. Um, it's Susan Stanford. The, uh, I'm Assistant Deputy Minister for Connectivity with the, with the province of BC. I'd just like to take a moment and expand on um, some of the broader connectivity pieces that are in play. Um, so the province has a joint agreement with um, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada to fund terrestrial builds um, in the province. Uh, and we're also working on a, a LEO satellite initiative, but the province has set a target that every home will be connected to high speed internet by 2027. So there's a significant amount of funding which is in play. Uh, we work with both the CRTC data as well as ISED, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada um, data set. And there's, there's ways of finding out which areas are eligible or considered underserved at this point in time. We also work with communities um, where there may be a discrepancy in, in service. So where um, data sources are saying that communities are, are served and homes are served, um, we're happy to work with communities to, to verify and validate that information um, for eligibility for funding and working with service providers to build infrastructure out. In BC, we have approximately 15,000 kilometers of primary and secondary highway. Um, of those kilometers, 4,200 are estimated to be without continuous cellular coverage at this point in time. The, um, of that 4,200 kilometers, about 31 also does not have available power. So the deployment of cellular along those stretches of highway, this includes um, the Alaska Highway and, and Highway 97, is being particularly challenging um, the province announced 75 million in expanding highway cellular um, earlier this year. And so while there is about 530 kilometers of uh, highway cellular expansion, which is in flight now, meaning um, cellular, you know, the, they're not built yet, it's not lit, but in the next uh, one to two years, um, those 530 kilometers should be um, available. In addition, there's 550 kilometers of the target of the new funding. So we should see more than a thousand kilometers of uh, new highway cellular coverage in, in the next few years. And we hope to continue and, and make that even broader. Where highway coverage uh, is not possible uh, based on constraints like power, we are working with um, local governments, regional governments, um, on deploying call boxes and uh, other types of connectivity for rest areas for emergency purposes. And I'll, I'll stop there. There's lots going on. <laughs> um, we're happy to do any briefings with anybody on, on what's happening with connectivity more broadly in the province. Thank you. Are there any, um, any other questions from participants? Maybe either jump in if you're on the phone or raise your hand. I have a follow-up question, Chris. Um, the working group that you mentioned um, that's willing to have uh, the membership opened up or um, or share updates or materials, what, could you tell us a bit more about that? And and are there any kind of Indigenous communities that are on it now? And what's the process if, uh, if they want to learn more and, and perhaps join? So yeah, I can tell you a little bit more about it. Um, I Would I say that we have good representation from an indigenous perspective? We have some, we don't, we don't have enough. So having more uh, participants would be great. Um, as far as that particular committee goes, it's a, we are a technical committee. So uh, if you were to take an administrator and drop them onto our technical committee, 
they would not find it a good use of their time and they'd be frustrated fairly quickly. So you have to have the right resource sitting in, uh, in terms of participation. Um, we also have a communications group that as we get this information available, we will make it available widely to uh, administrators and hire to assist in understanding in terms of next steps. Um, at this point, that group, like I said, is highly focused on the technical operational logistics to get this into place. If there is somebody that has a background that wants to participate, uh, they can, like I said, they can just send an email to me. I'll uh, provide my contact information in the chat here in a second. Uh, and I will uh, forward it on to the owners of that particular activity. Um, Thank you, Chris. Just checking the net again. Are there any uh, any questions based on what's been uh, presented so far? And I'm wondering after the call if um, we can have a look at some of the questions. I don't, I don't know in terms of roles and responsibilities for any Indigenous communities that want to learn more or to be involved. Um, I think in the presentation, we have a sense of ECOM and what they do operationally and what they're doing to implement uh, NG911. I think we have a sense from TELUS. Uh, in terms of uh, the province and Canada, and uh, I don't know if that's through the CRTC and the different groups, I wonder if, um, if there could be a bit of discussion on the roles and responsibilities like um, who would Indigenous communities contact if they wanted to learn more? How would they be involved? And, and what are the roles of, of some of the partners on the call in this, especially, you know, for a roadmap for the unserved areas or the basic 911 to next generation 911? Um, I know on the uh, the IS side for mapping, I know that Indigenous communities can apply for funding for mapping. Uh, Yannick, I'm, I'm sure you could speak to that. Um, could we maybe have a bit of a discussion on roles, responsibilities in terms of who Indigenous communities would, would approach and engage and ask for information? This is Stephen uh, for Ecom. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to participate in a conversation like that. I think that would be very, very helpful in terms of providing First Nations uh, leaders with the information they need to find out where to go and who to speak to on one particular topic. I think the additional advantage is it allows us to know who else is also assisting. Um, so we have a little bit of situational awareness across the board. Thank you, Stephen. And I know in the past there was the provincial 911 uh, steering committee, but my understanding it was uh, disbanded. I, I sat on that committee briefly for about a year, a year and a bit. So I don't know if there's any plans to reestablish that committee and have Indigenous representation on it. Um, maybe I can hear from the province on the on the role of uh, uh, the provincial colleagues on the call. Um, I, I can speak to that uh, for, for a couple of minutes. So uh, right now, the Ministry of Citizen Services, uh, Public Safety and Solicitor General and uh, um, emerging management and uh, climate readiness ministry. So the three main ministries are working on a an internal plan to um, reestablish those uh, engagements that we had in the you know, late part of the 2019-2020 uh, regarding 911. Um, we still, because it has been a while, so many of the previous participants in those uh, groups have uh, Kind of move to other positions and so on. So we're kind of regrouping a little bit. But to, to your question, uh, yes, there will be opportunities and the province will provide those opportunities once that we uh, establish the, 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 the way of um, engaging with the different groups um, uh, around topics of uh, 911 and Action 911 and so on. Thank you for that, Ivan. Is there any other provincial colleague who wants to comment a bit further? Uh, and that's helpful, Ivan. Ivan, sorry. 
Thanks, Casey. I'll just speak to the road centerline data set um, that's that's required for Next Generation 911. We have a provincial road data set called the Digital Road Atlas that my team works on. Um, we are working with several First Nations directly, um, having them review their roads and creating web apps and, and having them re review their addressing um, so that we can ensure that that 911 finds um, the caller. Um, and that's uh, applicable today, not just for, for next generation 911, but we want the digital road atlas to be available for First Nations and for local and regional governments who want to use that for their next generation 911 submissions. So I'll put my contact information in the chat and I'm, I'm happy to start the conversation with, with anyone on this call or, or any of your colleagues that aren't on the call. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Yannick, if you're on the line, Back in the day when the Provincial 911 Services Committee or Steering Committee existed, um, the uh, critical infrastructure folks from ISC were invited and attended meetings. And I wonder if you could speak just super brief about uh, an Indigenous community if they want to kind of pursue uh, mapping, especially enhanced mapping, and and what they would um, who they would contact. Yeah, so if a community wants to get uh, 911 mapping, uh, you can contact your uh, program advisor or the uh, the generic um, uh, BC ISC emergency management unit um, uh, mailbox, and um, and then we or or you can do an application through the uh, non structural mitigation uh, pro and preparedness um, funding through under EMAP. So if you go on on our website, um, you can go into uh, EMAP and it'd be under NSMP. Um, so every year we get a certain amount of funding for that, and uh, First Nations can apply um, directly on that on that program, and then will receive the files and do an application or do a, an application review from from there so thank you yannick um there's a question in the chat um the funding availability the minimum amount the maximum amount any timeline uh deadline and i know for uh nsmp which is the non-structural mitigation program uh is staff are helpful in providing feedback on drafts and uh, I know it might be a bit to um, put a proposal together for enhanced NG911 mapping. So uh, feedback's probably helpful. Is there a deadline or maximum or minimums for that funding, Yannick? So there's no minimum. Uh, if the program is under five, if, if the application is under $5,000, um, it's usually a little bit quicker um, due to just not having to go to an analysis through a headquarters, we can dispatch the money uh, regionally. Um, there's no deadlines also. So the the fund, we receive funds in, um, I wanna say usually fiscal year, but we start doing the review in around May. And, uh, and then the deadline ends for that year once we no longer have funding for it. Uh, I know this year we're still, <coughs> last year we, we ran really, we ran through that fund really quickly. This year we still have funding under NSMP. I think we're we've gone through about a third of our funding, um, so there's another two third available um, for uh, for an SMP. So um, so yeah, there's I don't remember if there's a maximum, but it's over two hundred fifty thousand dollars if there is a maximum because I've I've seen I've seen projects over that. So so yeah. Thank you. And I don't know if Brandon or any of the decision support staff want to chime in, but I've only assisted once with a mapping proposal. Uh, there was staffing involved for field people. There was um, satellite hardware devices that had to be bought. Um, there was a little bit of, of support from, uh, I think, an engineering partner and whatnot. So the amount was like well, well over 5,000, but uh, definitely under 100,000. Um, Brenda, or any of the decision support folks, uh, do you want to chime in on some of the mapping and how communities can do that? Uh, yeah, with our decision support team, we've hired a few trainers this year, Michelle Jacobs being one of them, uh, who's on the call here. But basically, we put together a lot of different forms and processes to help communities identify critical infrastructure, capture all the address information, 
to try to basically have all that data available for when the opportunity came, we could help uh, work with them to connect them to NG911. So with the decision support tools, there's a lot of different ways that we can map things out, uh, make maps and that sort of thing. Uh, Casey, I think you're alluding to a project that was done through DRR where uh, they identified critical infrastructure, weather stations, mapped them all out and things. I think it was for uh, for a coastal community and they they put an application to us. So we kind of checked and saw what other communities were doing and we helped them with a budget and process. Um, and and I personally would offer support to a community if you wanted a bit of help. And I would encourage um, getting feedback from ISK in terms of, of how to make it uh, as good as possible. Um, there's a question, anyone available to nations with assisting with completing the funding applications? Um, I'm willing to help. Uh, there's, Yep, it could be overwhelming for communities to do to do the application. Uh, it's Casey speaking, sorry. And there are um, emerging mapping standards for next generation 911. I don't know where that's at specifically, um, but if a community is dealing with uh, a consultant, it's really key that they don't do just the basic 911 mapping, that they try to do the enhanced and I don't know, Yannick, or um, if any of the technical people want to comment on those standards. Yannick? Yeah, I don't know on the standards of those specifically. Uh, I was just going to say if um, the the application for the for for EMAP is 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 pretty it's pretty simple. Like it's not it's not too too complicated. Uh, we basically kind of need to know the estimated cost for the systems, the program, what they want to do, and then some sort of timeline with that. Um, so it, it requires a bit of work uh, on the nation to figure out uh, what contractor they want to work with and, and what estimated costs are, uh, and then provide kind of a, an idea of what the project is about and what the deliverables are and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, you, you can contact, so Krista, you can contact me if you want, or Casey, or any anyone on our team um, to go through through that process. And more than happy to uh, to kind of walk or talk you through it, or should I ask some questions um, for clarification that would, would make the application stronger. But there, there's not, um, there's not a huge amount of uh of analysis and comparison between different projects uh it's usually more on a on a case-by-case -case basis and on on the needs that that we're kind of seeing um so, so yeah i'm looking in the chat and there's a link for the standards for next generation 911 in the chat and i'm assuming that has the uh, the mapping standards is that correct That is correct, uh, Casey. Perfect. That's really helpful. Um, this is really technical, um, multi-year, and uh, there's been a lot of questions raised, and I think um, there'll be future meetings. What I'd like to do with uh, the presenters and organizers who helped put this on is maybe come up with a, a little FAQ for some of the broader questions, like... Um, especially from the uh, from the indigenous communities. And then just kind of clarity on the path moving forward, like we talked about who to contact, how to get involved. And Ivan, I know you talked about the uh, the three ministries getting involved in a internal plan for um, reestablishing engagement. Sorry, that's my phone. And uh, I think the FAQ and the follow-up we do have the monthly Indigenous Circle of Practice, uh, the first Tuesday of every month, usually 10 a.m. till noon. So whenever it makes sense, once we kind of do an FAQ and a bit of materials and get a sense of the, um, the reestablishment of an engagement plan, it would be good to kind of update the participants of the circle. And they're mainly um, 
people who work in staff positions in Indigenous communities as emergency program coordinators or community safety officers or fire departments. Um, so I'd just like to put that out there that uh, this was really good. I know we kind of scrambled to put it on. It's highly technical. So maybe in the um, maybe in the early fall, we can have an update and uh, bring it to the circle. Does that sound okay from uh, my colleagues on the call? Are there any um, any last minute questions? We're at 1142. I'm just checking the chat. Okay. My thank you to all the presenters. Uh, my thank you to all the uh, participants who took the time. Um, super complex, super technical. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping there's going to be a really good engagement plan for Indigenous communities. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, the unserved areas and the basic areas that, you know, in the years ahead, uh, we'll really have some improvements and some capacity building. So um, my thanks to each and everyone on this call and uh, have a have a great day, everyone. And Thank this session is being recorded as well. Thanks, Casey. Thank you, Casey. Day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Casey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Well done, and uh, we we'll look forward to the next session. We'll certainly help you get some documentation together. For sure, and it's it's reminded me how darn technical this thing is. Yeah, and uh, you know, poor uh, poor Blair is living that every day as we try to drive this project uh, forward, and just the resources.